Section twelve of Notes on Nursing by Florence Nightingale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section twelve Chattering Hopes and Advices. The Sick Man to His Advisers. My advisers, the name is Legion. Somehow or other, it seems a provision of the universal destinies that every man, woman, and child should consider him, her, or its self, privileged especially to advise me. Why? That is precisely what I want to know. And this is what I have to say to them. I have been advised to go to every place extant in and out of England, to take every kind of exercise by every kind of cart, carriage, yes, and even swing, and dumbbell in existence to imbibe every different kind of stimulus that ever has been invented. And this, when those best fitted to know, that is, medical men, after long and close attendance, had declared any journey out of the question, had prohibited any kind of motion whatever, had closely laid down the diet and drink. What would my advisers say, were they the medical attendants, and I the patient left their advice, and took the casual advisers. But the singularity in Legion's mind is this. It never occurs to him that everybody else is doing the same thing, and that I, the patient, must, perforce say, in sheer defence, like Rosalind, I could not do with all. Chattering hopes may seem an odd heading, but I really believe there is scarcely a greater worry which invalids have to endure than the incurable hopes of their friends. There is no one practice against which I can speak more strongly from actual personal experience, wide and long, of its effects during sickness, observed both upon others and upon myself. I would appeal most seriously to all friends, visitors, and attendants of the sick, to leave off this practice of attempting to cheer the sick, by making light of their danger and by exaggerating their probabilities of recovery. Far more now than formerly does the medical attendant tell the truth to the sick, who are really desirous to hear it about their own state. How intense is the folly, then, to say the least of it, of the friend, be he even a medical man, who thinks that his opinion, given after cursory observation, will weigh with the patient against the opinion of the medical attendant, given perhaps after years of observation, after using every help to diagnosis afforded by the stethoscope, the examination of pulse, tongue, etc., and certainly after much more observation than the friend can possibly have had. Supposing the patient to be possessed of common sense, how can the favourable opinion, if it is to be called an opinion at all, of the casual visitor cheer him, when different from that of the experienced attendant? Unquestionably the latter may, and often does, turn out to be wrong. But which is most likely to be wrong? The fact is that the patient is not cheered at all by these well-meaning, most tiresome friends. On the contrary, he is depressed and wearied. If, on the one hand, he exerts himself to tell each successive member of this too numerous conspiracy, whose name is Legion, why he does not think as they do, in what respect he is worse, what symptoms exist that they know nothing of, he is fatigued instead of cheered, and his attention is fixed upon himself. In general, patients who are really ill do not want to talk about themselves. Hypochondriacs do, but again I say we are not on the subject of hypochondriacs. If, on the other hand, and which is much more frequently the case, the patient says nothing, but the Shakespearean, oh, ah, go to, and in good sooth, in order to escape from the conversation about himself the sooner, he is depressed by want of sympathy. He feels isolated in the midst of friends. He feels what a convenience it would be if there were any single person to whom he could speak simply and openly, without pulling the string upon himself of this shower-bath of silly hopes and encouragements, to whom he could express his wishes and directions, without that person persisting in saying, 
I hope that it will please God yet to give you twenty years, or you have a long life of activity before you. How often we see at the end of biographies, or of cases recorded in medical papers, after a long illness A died rather suddenly, or unexpectedly both to himself and to others. Unexpectedly to others, perhaps, who did not see, because they did not look, but by no means unexpectedly to himself, as I feel entitled to believe, both from the internal evidence in such stories, and from watching similar cases. There was every reason to expect that A would die, and he knew it, but he found it useless to insist upon his own knowledge to his friends. In these remarks, I am alluding neither to acute cases, which terminate rapidly, nor to nervous cases. By the first, much interest in their own danger is very rarely felt. In writings of fiction, whether novels or biographies, these deathbeds are generally depicted as almost seraphic in lucidity of intelligence. Sadly, large has been my experience in deathbeds, and I can only say that I have seldom or never seen such. Indifference, excepting with regard to bodily suffering, or to some duty the dying man desires to perform, is the far more usual state. The nervous case, on the other hand, delights in figuring to himself and others a fictitious danger. But the long, chronic case, who knows too well himself, and who has been told by his physician that he will never enter active life again, who feels that every month he has to give up something he could do the month before, oh, spare such sufferers your chattering hopes. You do not know how you worry and weary them. Such real sufferers cannot bear to talk of themselves, still less to hope for what they cannot at all expect. So also, as to all the advice showered so profusely upon such sick, to leave off some occupation, to try some other doctor, some other house, climate, pill, powder, or specific. I say nothing of the inconsistency for these advisers are sure to be the same persons who exhorted the sick person not to believe his own doctor's prognostics, because doctors are always mistaken, but to believe some other doctor because this doctor is always right. Sure also are these advisers to be the persons to bring the sick man fresh occupation, while exhorting him to leave his own. Wonderful is the face with which friends, lay and medical, will come in and worry the patient with recommendations to do something or other, having just as little knowledge as to its being feasible, or even safe for him, as if they were to recommend a man to take exercise, not knowing he had broken his leg. What would the friend say, if he were the medical attendant, and if the patient, because some other friend had come in, because somebody, anybody, nobody, had recommended something, anything, nothing, were to disregard his orders, and take that other body's recommendations. But people never think of this. A celebrated historical personage has related the commonplaces which, when on the eve of executing a remarkable resolution, were showered in nearly the same words by everyone around, successively, for a period of six months. To these, the personage states, that it was found least trouble always to reply the same thing, that is, that it could not be supposed that such a resolution had been taken without sufficient previous consideration. To patients enduring every day for years, from every friend or acquaintance, either by letter or viva voce, some torment of this kind, I would suggest the same answer. It would indeed be spared if such friends and acquaintances would but consider for one moment that it is probable that the patient has heard such advice at least fifty times before, and that, had it been practicable, it would have been practised long ago. But of such consideration there appears to be no chance. Strange, though true, the people should be just the same in these things as they were a few hundred years ago. To me, these commonplaces, leaving their smear upon the cheerful, single-hearted, constant devotion to duty, which is so often seen in the decline of such sufferers, recall the slimy trail left by the snail, 
on the sunny southern garden wall loaded with fruit. No mockery in the world is so hollow as the advice showered upon the sick. It is of no use for the sick to say anything, for what the adviser wants is not to know the truth about the state of the patient, but to turn whatever the sick may say to the support of his own argument. Set forth, it must be repeated, without any inquiry whatever into the patient's real condition. But it would be impertinent or indecent in me to make such an inquiry, says the adviser. True, and how much more impertinent is it to give your advice when you can know nothing about the truth and admit you could not inquire into it? To nurses, I say, these are the visitors who do your patient harm. When you hear him told, one, that he has nothing the matter with him and that he wants cheering, two, that he is committing suicide and that he wants preventing, three, that he is the tool of somebody who makes use of him for a purpose, four, that he will listen to nobody but is obstinately bent upon his own way, and five, that he ought to be called to the sense of duty and is flying in the face of providence, then know that your patient is receiving all the injury that he can receive from a visitor. How little the real sufferings of illness are known or understood! How little does any one in good health fancy him or even herself into the life of a sick person! Do, you who are about the sick, or who visit the sick, try and give them some pleasure. Remember to tell them what will do so. How often in such visits the sick person has to do the whole conversation, exerting his own imagination and memory, while you would take the visitor, absorbed in his own anxieties, making no effort of memory or imagination for the sick person. Oh, my dear, I have so much to think of, I really quite forgot to tell him that. Besides, I thought he would know it, says the visitor to another friend. How could he know it? Depend upon it, the people who say this are really those who have little to think of. There are many burdened with business who always manage to keep a pigeonhole in their minds, full of things to tell the invalid. I do not say, don't tell him your anxieties. I believe it is good for him, and good for you too. But if you tell him what is anxious, surely you can remember to tell him what is pleasant too. A sick person does so enjoy hearing good news, for instance of a love and courtship, while in progress to a good ending. If you tell him only when the marriage takes place, he loses half the pleasure, which God knows he has little enough of, and ten to one but you have told him of some love-making with a bad ending. A sick person also intensely enjoys hearing of any material good, any positive or practical success of the right. He has so much of books and fiction, of principles and precepts and theories. Do, instead of advising him with advice he has heard at least fifty times before, tell him of one benevolent act which has really succeeded practically. It is like a day's health to him. You have no idea what the craving of sick, with undiminished power of thinking, but little power of doing, is to hear of good practical action when they can no longer partake in it. Do observe these things with the sick. Do remember how their life is to them disappointed and incomplete. You can see them lying there with miserable disappointments, from which they can have no escape but death, and you can't remember to tell them of what would give them so much pleasure, or at least an hour's variety. They don't want you to be lachrymose and whining with them. They like you to be fresh and active and interested, but they cannot bear absence of mind, and they are so tired of the advice and preaching they receive from everybody, no matter who it is they see. There is no better society than babies and sick people for one another. Of course you must manage this so that neither shall suffer from it, which is perfectly possible. If you think the air of the sick room bad for the baby. Why, it is bad for the invalid too, and therefore of course you will correct it for both. It freshens up our sick person's whole mental atmosphere to see the baby. And a very young child, if unspoiled, 
will generally adapt itself wonderfully to the ways of a sick person, if the time they spend together is not too long. If you knew how unreasonably sick people suffer from reasonable causes of distress, you would take more pains about all these things. An infant laid upon the sick-bed will do the sick person, thus suffering, more good than all your logic. A piece of good news will do the same. Perhaps you are afraid of disturbing him. You say there is no comfort for his present cause of affliction. It is perfectly reasonable. The distinction is this. If he is obliged to act, do not disturb him with another subject of thought just yet. Help him to do what he wants to do. But, if he has done this, or nothing can be done, then disturb him by all means. You will relieve, more effectually, unreasonable suffering from reasonable causes, by telling him the news, showing him the baby, or giving him something new to think of, or to look at, than by all the logic in the world. It has been very justly said that the sick are like children in this, that there is no proportion in events to them. Now it is your business, as their visitor, to restore this right proportion for them, to show them what the rest of the world is doing. How can they find it out otherwise? You will find them far more open to conviction than children in this. And you will find that their unreasonable intensity of suffering from unkindness, from want of sympathy, etc., will disappear with their freshened interest in the big world's events. But then you must be able to give them real interests, not gossip. Note. There are two classes of patients which are, unfortunately, becoming more common every day, especially among women of the richer orders, to whom all these remarks are preeminently inapplicable. 1. Those who make health an excuse for doing nothing, and, at the same time, allege that the being able to do nothing is their only grief. 2. Those who have brought upon themselves ill health by over-pursuit of amusement, which they and their friends have most unhappily called intellectual activity. I scarcely know a greater injury that can be inflicted than the advice too often given to the first class to vegetate, or the admiration too often bestowed on the latter class for pluck. End of section 12